I'm Curtis Hudson, editor of The Sword of the Lord, a bi-weekly Christian paper started in 1934 by Dr. John R. Rice. In 1961, I was a mail carrier and pastor of a small church just outside Atlanta, Georgia. One day, while delivering the mail, I saw a copy of The Sword of the Lord and decided I'd read some of the articles during my lunch hour. In that particular paper, there was an advertisement for a Sword of the Lord conference on revival and soul winning. These were conferences that had been started by Dr. John R. Rice to promote revival and soul winning. At that conference, I heard a step-by-step -step lecture explaining in detail how to lead a person to Christ. I was so convinced that it would work that I went out on Saturday after hearing the lecture on Thursday and led my first three souls to Christ, a man, his wife, and teenage son. The next day, which was Sunday, they all three joined my church. And I got to thinking, I should be doing this all the time. So a few weeks later, I resigned my job at the post office and decided to give all my energy, time, and effort to winning souls and building a church. We saw that tiny congregation of about 40 members grow to over 8,000 in membership and become the largest church in the state of Georgia. But it all began at that Sword of the Lord conference on revival and soul winning. The Great Commission is given five times in the Bible, namely this, Mark 16, 15, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And yet, while I'm speaking to you right now, so far as I know, no generation has ever evangelized the world. And today, we're no closer to it than we were a few generations ago. Now, I'm not sure you can trust all the statistics you read, but I have read that if we could line all the unsaved people up in a single file, they'd circle the globe 30 times, and the line grows 20 miles every day you live. I've also read if we could freeze the population of the world like it is, so no one else was born and no one else died, and we won souls at the same rate we won them last year, it would take 4,000 years to win the world to Christ, and 320 years when the United States of America to Christ. Now, why are we so far behind? Why have we never evangelized the world? Well, I think we're going at it wrong. We're trying to evangelize the world from the pulpits of the churches, or maybe in big citywide campaigns, or maybe by sending missionaries around the world. Now, for all of this, it is very important but God's plan for world evangelization is that every individual Christian be a soul winner. In John 15, verse 16, Jesus said, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain. Now, you must remember that the fruit of a Christian is not love, joy, peace, and long-suffering, and so on. That is the fruit of the Spirit whenever the Christian is Spirit-controlled or Spirit-filled. The fruit of a Christian is other Christians. Proverbs 11.30 says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. Paul said in Romans chapter 1, I will not have you to be ignorant, that oft times I purpose to come unto you, that I might have some fruit among you even as among other Gentiles. Paul is simply saying, I... I want to win some of you people to Christ. Now, it's my job as a Christian to win souls. My job as a preacher really is not to win souls. Now, that may shock you, but Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12 says, He gave some apostles and some prophets and some pastors and teachers and so on. And then verse 12 says, For the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. My job as an evangelist or as a Bible teacher is not to win souls to Christ, but to perfect the saints for the work of the ministry, which, which is leading people to Christ, because the work of the ministry results in the edifying or building of the body of Christ. And the body of Christ is built as people are saved. Every time a man trusts Christ as Savior, or an individual trusts Christ as Savior, they're placed by the Holy Spirit into the body, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. Here the Bible says, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. Now here it is. I lead a man to Christ. He's placed into the body by the Holy Spirit. The body gains another member until the body is complete and Christ comes for it. 
Now, my job as a pastor is to perfect the saints for the work of the ministry. So the work of the ministry has to be leading people to Christ. Yet, there are many Christians who've never led one soul to Christ. I heard Dr. Lee Robertson say, by the way, Dr. Robertson for 40 years was pastor of Highland Park Baptist Church in Chattanooga, Tennessee. In those 40 years, he baptized over 60,000 converts, which means they averaged 1,500 baptisms every year for 40 years. Dr. Robertson said, I doubt that if 5% of the members of Highland Park Baptist Church have ever led a soul to Christ. Now, I don't think that's unusual. I mean by that, it's not, a, it's not unlike many other churches. I don't know of any church that probably has a higher percentage of soul winners than that. Our church in Atlanta with 8,000 members uh, probably only had a handful of people who led souls to Christ every week and brought them to church and down the aisle to join that local assembly. Now, why are no more people involved in winning souls than what they are? Yet, all of us are supposed to be doing it. But I think the reason we do not win souls is we don't see the importance of it. We always find time to do the things we really believe are important. I remember the night my wife complained with a stomach ache. And I asked if she thought I should get some medicine of some kind. She said, no, I think I'll be all right. A while later, she complained again. I said, are you sure you're okay? She said, I'm fine. Uh, later, she complained a third time, and I said, don't you think maybe I should take you to the doctor? She said, well, I don't think so. But a little while later, she awoke me and said, I must go to the doctor. My, my stomach is hurting too bad. It must be something more than what I'm thinking. And I rushed to the doctor in the middle of the night, and the doctor performed a, an appendectomy on my wife. And here's the point I'm making. Here it was in the middle of the night. I had to get someone to come in and stay with the children. I had to get up and get dressed. Uh, keeping in mind, I had to go to work the next morning. But the thought of my inconvenience or the thought of the expense or inconvenience in my neighbors never came into the question. The only thing important to me was my wife was sick and I wanted her to live. I, I found time to do that because that was important. We find time to do things that are really important to us. If we could get every Christian to see the importance of winning people to Christ, I'm convinced that we could get more people leading souls to Christ. Let me take just a few minutes and see if I can emphasize the importance of soul winning. I don't think I can succeed, but I'll try. Soul winning is important because of the price of a soul. How much is one soul worth? Well, a French doctor has declared that he's determined the weight of a human soul. He said he did it by placing the bodies of terminally ill patients on very sensitive scales. And he noticed that when they died that the needle dropped 21 grams. So his conclu conclusion was that a soul weighs 21 grams. Now, I don't know how much a soul is weighs, but I, I have some idea of how much one is worth. Jesus said in Mark 8, verse 36 and 37, For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what would a man give in exchange for his soul? Now, if I understand these verses, one soul, one soul is worth the entire world. The soul of the little boy who lives next door. The soul of your best friend that you play golf with or, or go on outings with. The soul of your mother the soul of the little child it's God's given you to raise. One soul is worth the whole world. The soul of one little boy you meet on the street, the soul of the postman, or the druggist. And how, how, much is a, how much is a soul worth? The world. But when you think about the world, it's more than the material universe. The Bible says in 1 John 2, 15, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eye and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Now, the world consists of three things. First, the lust of the flesh. The lust of the flesh is a consuming desire to do. Now, try to imagine that from the day you were born until right now that every time your flesh ever desired anything, you fulfill that desire. And imagine that I could promise you that if you live to be 100 years old, that any time your flesh desired anything, you, you could fulfill that desire. 
well, you would have gained one-third of the world, but you wouldn't have the entire world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eye and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. The lust of the eye is a compelling urge to have. The eye sees something, and it wants it. Now, imagine that everything your eye ever saw and wanted, you had it. It was yours. You had the title deed in your hands. And imagine I could guarantee you that if you live to be 100 years old, that every time your eyes saw something and wanted it, you could have it. Then you would have gained the second third of the world, but you wouldn't have the whole world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eye and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. The pride of life is a constant thrust to be its ambition. I want to be first-string quarterback. I want to be senator. I want to be governor. The pride of life is a constant thrust to be. Now imagine that you could fulfill every ambition of life and realize everything you ever wanted to be in your life. As long as you lived, then you would have had the third, third of the world. Now watch it. I call the lust of the flesh the ultimate in fun from a human standpoint, from a carnal fleshly standpoint. I call the pride of, or the uh, lust of the eye the ultimate in fortune owning all that one could own and nothing else to own. And I call the pride of life the ultimate in fame. Now imagine having all the fun one could have, owning all that one could own, and being all that one could be. Put that on one side and bring on this side the soul of one individual, whether he be educated or uneducated, and bring Jesus into the room and ask him, Jesus, which of these are the most valuable? And I believe with all of my heart that Jesus would answer with a tear in his eye, what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what would a man give in exchange for his soul? Don't you see, sowing is important because of the value of a soul. You'd be better off to win one soul to Christ in your life. And of course you could win many more, but you'd be better off to win one soul to Christ than to spend your life and earn two or three billion dollars and die leaving a fortune behind. Unless that fortune was used to win souls to Christ, of course. Second, sowing is important because of the payment Jesus made for souls. I wish I could explain the sufferings of Christ on the cross, but I don't think I can. The songwriter tried, but he said, none of the ransom ever knew. How deep was the valley crossed? Or how dark was the night that the Lord passed through ere he found his sheep that was lost. Jesus suffered on the cross everything I would have to suffer if I were to die without Christ, go into hell and stay there forever and ever and never get out. I have a sermon I sometimes preach entitled Calvary, The Sinner's Hell in Review. In that sermon, I read the story of the crucifixion. And I read the story of the rich man in hell. I go from one to the other showing that the rich man in hell suffered thirst. Then I go back to the cross and show that Jesus Christ suffered thirst on the cross, the very thirst of hell. He cried out, I thirst. That was a filth cross utterance. The rich man said, send Lazarus. Let him dip his finger in water and cool my tongue for I'm tormented in this flame. The rich man suffered separation. And on the cross, Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He suffered separation. I need not labor the point, but what I'm trying to say is that Jesus suffered all on the cross that I would suffer if I were to die and go into hell and stay there forever and ever and never get out. That's the price Jesus Christ paid for souls. And by the way, he would have suffered if he only had one soul to die for. He loves us that much. Now, if Jesus suffered that much for souls, don't you think that that makes soul winning important? Soul winning is important because of the price of souls, because of the payment Jesus made for souls. But let me suggest one other thing before I get into this lecture. Soul winning is important, too, because of the peril of souls. Men are lost. They're not going to be lost someday. They're lost now. John 3, 18 plainly says, He that believeth on the Son is not condemned. He's not under the sentence. The sentence has been lifted. He's justified. 
But he goes on to say, He that believeth not the Son is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Now, there it is very plainly. Men are condemned or lost for one reason, because they have not believed or trusted Jesus Christ as personal Savior. Now, consider that. Every person you see is either condemned or not condemned. If they're trusting Christ, they're not condemned. If they're not trusting Christ, they're condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Try to visualize your neighbors as, as though they may be good moral people, but try to visualize them if they've never trusted Christ as people that are already condemned. If they die, they're not going to some judgment and there have God determined whether or not they're going to heaven or hell. That is already determined at the present moment by whether or not they're trusting Jesus Christ as Savior. Don't you see the importance of soul winning? I wish Jesus Christ himself were here. And I wish we could ask him, Jesus, why did you come to the earth? What's the Bible all about? Why are all these church buildings throughout the country? What's that all about? And Jesus would answer in Luke 19, 10, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's as plain as he could make it. Jesus came for one reason, to seek and to save those who were lost. The Apostle Paul, one of the greatest Christians that ever lived, who wrote half the New Testament, if you give him Hebrews, and, and we believe he did write Hebrews, that means he wrote 14 of 27 New Testament books. If Paul were here, and, and we could ask Paul, Paul, what's it all about? Why did Jesus come? To build churches or schools or, or to build religions? Why did Jesus come? And Paul would answer, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Jesus Christ came to save sinners of whom I'm chief. So winning is the most important thing in the world. It's the only thing that causes rejoicing in heaven. When we get big offerings, heaven doesn't rejoice. When we have large crowds, heaven doesn't rejoice. When we build new buildings or buy new transportation, heaven doesn't rejoice. But the scripture plainly says in Luke 15, 10, there's more rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repenteth than 99 just persons who need no repentance. Nothing else causes heaven to rejoice except the salvation of sinners. We could evangelize the world, in my opinion, in a few short months we get every Christian involved in leading others to Christ. And that's what it's all about. When Jesus gave the Great Commission in Matthew 28, he said you're to go, you're to teach them, you're to baptize them. And then he said one more thing. You're to teach them to observe whatsoever I've commanded you. Now, let me stop there a minute. Uh, that verse, in our opinion, does not mean teach them the Bible, though I'm for teaching them the Bible. Of course, you can't teach too much Bible and you can't learn too much Bible. But the verse says to teach them to do whatsoever I commanded you. Now, what did he command them? They were commanded to go and teach or give the gospel. Mark says preach the gospel. Then they were commanded to baptize the converts. And once they're baptized, then they were to teach the converts to do what they were told to do. Now watch this. They were told to get somebody saved and get them baptized. Then take that individual and teach him to do what they were told to do, which is get someone saved and get them baptized. With that method, you start a chain reaction. And through the principle of multiplication, we can evangelize the world. So suppose I lead one man to Christ and teach him how to lead one to Christ. And he teaches somebody else and teaches him. And suppose this chain reaction goes on and on. Eventually, through the principle of multiplication, we could reach everybody in our town. Now, not all of them will be saved, but we could get to them with the gospel and give them a clear presentation of the gospel and show them how to be saved. By the way, it's not our job to save people. It's our job to make sure people know how to be saved, to show them how to be saved. It's up to the individual to trust Christ as Savior or not to trust Him. What I want to do now is give a step-by-step -step lecture on how to lead a soul to Christ. Much of this is practical information, but I believe it's very important information. What I'll share with you is, is material that I've been using. In other words, it's what I have been doing since 1961 that has resulted in people being saved every week of my life. 
And while I was pastoring, we had people join the church every week for baptism that I had led to Christ myself during the week. Now, this does not include the people that others had led to Christ. So I'm saying this to convince you that what I'm about to share with you is very important. So I hope you'll jot down some notes and keep the information. Number one, have a definite time to go. If you don't schedule some definite time to win souls to Christ, the chances are you'll never go. If someone ever invites you out to dinner and, and says something like this, will you have dinner with us sometime? You'll probably say yes. But the truth of the matter is you probably will never go because you didn't set a definite time. I often have preachers say to me, would you come preach in our church? And I'd say, yes, I'll be glad to come sometime. But unless they set a definite time, I never go. The man who makes up his mind, well, I'm going to lead souls to Christ someday, never does it. So I suggest that right now, while you're making notes, that you just jot down a time that you think you can give to soul winning, maybe Saturday afternoon from 2 until 4, or from 4 till 6. If your church has a soul winning visitation program, uh, then that'd be a good time to go soul winning. Have a definite time to go. Now, the second thing I'd like to share with you is be soul conscious. Remember that everyone you meet is a soul for whom Jesus died. And they're either going to heaven or hell when they die. Don't pass up people that need Christ. A lot of people pass up great prospects while they're looking for someone in particular. I remember one night my son and I had stopped at the service station. And he mentioned to me, Dad, uh, are you going to witness to that man? I hadn't thought about it really, but when he asked me, I decided I would. So I reached in my pocket, and when the man came back out, and I handed him a track. And I said, what's your name? Bill, he said. I said, Bill, here's a track. It'll tell you how to go to heaven when you die. Will you promise to read it? Sure, he said. Then I said, Bill, if you were to die, do you know you'd go to heaven? Well, he said, no, I don't know that for sure. And then I said, it won't take but just a few moments for me to tell you what's in that track. And so I began. First, you must realize you are a sinner and shared the plan of salvation with this dear man. And standing next to our automobile, uh, next to a gas pump in a service station, this dear man bowed his head and trusted Christ as Savior. Be soul conscious. I was on a plane one day, and I always request an aisle seat. And uh, it so happened that the center seat was empty, and a, a lady, maybe in her 30s, was sitting in the seat next to the window. I noticed that she was weeping, and uh, I felt maybe I should say something to her, but I didn't want to invade her privacy in any way. But after a while, I, I said, uh, I don't want to be nosy, but you seem to be concerned about something. I'm a preacher. Is this something I could help you with? And she said, my mother passed away, and I'm going to my mother's funeral. I said, I'm sorry, and, and I said, I'll be praying for you. I said, was your mother a Christian? Oh, yes, she said, mother was a Christian. I said, that's wonderful. We've been flying a few more moments, and I said to her, what about you? If you had been in your mother's place, if God had called you first, would you have gone to heaven? Well, she said, no, I'm, I'm not sure. And I said to this precious lady, you know, I can ask you four questions, and if you answer them honestly, I can tell you whether or not you're going to heaven when you die. I didn't say anything else, and... Several minutes went by, and she said to me, well, are you going to ask me? And I said, sure, if you'd like for me to, and I began. Number one, you must admit you're a sinner. And I went through the entire plan of salvation that I'm going to share with you in just a few minutes when I give you the demonstration. And that precious lady on the plane trusted Jesus Christ as her Savior. People all around us are, are prospects. You cannot witness to the wrong person at the wrong time because Jesus died for all men. And the Bible says now is the day of salvation. So you can't make a mistake. The only mistake you make is in not telling folks how to be saved. Number three, be neat and clean. We are the ambassadors of Christ, so says the Bible in 2 Corinthians 5.20. Now, if the president were to ask me to be an ambassador for this nation, I'd want to look my very best. This doesn't mean you have to buy expensive clothes, but it means as an ambassador for Christ, I ought to dress the part. So I ought to be neat and clean. We don't want to turn people off by our appearance. I used to say to preachers as I lectured around the country, people judge you by three things. 
by how you look, that is your appearance, by how you talk, your conversation, and by how you act. But the majority of the decisions made about us are based solely on our appearance because very few people ever get to hear us talk and, and even fewer get to observe our actions. Uh, I sit in airports and I'm kind of a people watcher and I find myself making judgments. I don't mean critical judgments, but saying, you know, that's a sharp looking fella. He looks successful. Uh, he looks like he knows where he's going. And all these judgments are based solely on the people's appearance. So our appearance is important. Be neat and clean. Number four, carry a New Testament with you. Now I mention New Testament because some people may carry a large Bible. I have a testament in my hand. This New Testament can be placed inside my coat pocket and no one will ever see it. Or if you're a lady, you can place that New Testament in your purse and no one sees it. If you approach your home and you have a large Bible in your hand, people see it and tend to turn you off before you ever have an opportunity to show them how to be saved. It's best if, you, if you're going to attack someone with a weapon to conceal the weapon. <laughs> now that may not be a good analogy, but the Bible is the sword of the Spirit. It's the Word of God. And if I'm going to use this to help someone, I don't want to turn him off and close the door of opportunity. So I'll keep it in my inside coat pocket where no one can see it. Then I'll approach the house and meet the individual and have some conversation. After we talk a while, then I get around to asking the question, if you die today, do you know you go to heaven? When he says no, then I take the Bible and show him how to be saved. Uh, number five, go two by two. Now I make this practical suggestion because it seems to me that in the New Testament they went out two by two. You may read Matthew chapter 10 and you'll see where he sent them out two by two. This way one can pray for the other one as the person doing the witnessing is explaining how to be saved. If I have a deacon with me and, and I start to present the plan of salvation, then the deacon should pray very fervently that God would use this witness to his own glory and that the person being witnessed to would be receptive and that they would trust Christ as Savior. You see, God does answer prayer. The Bible says in James 4, 2, you have not because you ask not. So we ought to pray. Now, if the deacon begins to witness first, then, then what I should do is, is pray for the deacon, that he'll be effective in his witnessing. So go two by two. It's always good, too, to go with different people. Don't go with the same person every time because you, you tend to get in a rut. And if you're not careful, your sowing time will become a fellowship time or a get-together time where you talk to each other and you really do not witness to people or, or pass out gospel tracts. So go with different people. Next thing I want to say is uh, go believing and expecting. I think we fail many times because we expect to fail. A man said to Spurgeon one time, the great preacher from England, Mr. Spurgeon, I'm not seeing as many people saved as, as I'd like to see saved. Spurgeon said, well, you don't expect to see people saved every time you preach, do you? And the man said, well, of course not. And Spurgeon replied, that's the reason they're not saved every time you preach. So go believing and expecting. Now, how can you, how can you build faith? That is faith about getting people saved. Uh, Romans 10, 17 says, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Take that verse in Psalm 126, verse 6. Memorize it. Here the Bible says, He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with it. Now here's a clear promise. If I go, and I go with compassion for the lost, and I bear the precious seed, which is the word of God, according to Luke 8, 11, then the promise is, without a doubt, I mean, no doubt about it, I'm going to come back rejoicing, bringing sheaves with me. Now, when I read that verse, I have great faith, and I have great confidence, and I believe if I do what the verse says, God will do what he promised. So I can go believing and expecting. My faith is built on a clear promise from the Bible. Number nine, be nice. I often say, the way to a man's heart is not down his throat. If you go into a home to witness to someone, and let's say the man has a, a can of beer in his hand, uh, you wouldn't get hysterical and go to screaming about his drinking beer and say you're going to hell for drinking beer. 
That's not the approach you use. You just ignore that. After all, a man is not saved by changing his conduct. You don't get better to get saved. You get saved to get better. Now, you ought to memorize that because a lot of folks say, well, you do this and you do that, you do the other, you'll be saved. A fellow said to Dr. Bob Jones Sr. one time, Bob, as soon as I get on my feet, I'm going to become a Christian. And Bob replied, you don't become a Christian by getting on your feet. You become a Christian by getting on your face. And Dr. Jones is absolutely right about that. One becomes a Christian by trusting Christ as Savior. Our problem with God is not conduct, but nature. The new birth does not change conduct. It changes nature. And the new nature then results in a new conduct. So if you start fussing at a man about some bad habits, you're not going into Christ. Be nice. In connection with that, let me say, be complimentary. People like to have nice things said about them. When I go into a home out soul winning, I, I try to find something in the home that I can compliment the people on. If there's a beautiful picture on the wall, I'll comment about the picture and ask, where did you get that? Or if the yards are manicured and, and the walks are edged beautifully and the uh, hedges are trimmed, I'll comment about what a beautiful yard they have. Or if it's a clean automobile, I'll copy them on the clean automobile. Be complimentary. People like to have nice things said about them. Remember, these are lost people you're witnessing to. And what you're doing is, is you are, in a sense, breaking the ice. You're breaking down a barrier. You're getting ready to communicate with them. But you never get a man saved until you really get him open and get him listening to the gospel. So be complimentary. Number 11, be careful about going in. Now, here's what I mean by that. If a lady is out during the daytime, knocking on doors, visiting and witnessing to people, she should never go into a home where a man is alone. And I think it's also very wise that the preacher or the male never go into a home where a woman is alone. In that case, you can simply hand them a gospel track at the door and ask them if they'd read it. Go back and visit with them later and see if they did read it and ask them what they thought about it. And from that, give the plan of salvation and lead the person to Christ. Two, when I say be careful about going in, I, I've gone to homes and, and the man be outside maybe grilling steaks or hamburgers. And it's very obvious to me the man's about to have supper or dinner, depending on which part of the country you're from, I guess. But uh, they're about to have a meal. And uh, I will say something like this, oh, I'm sorry, I caught you at a bad time. Let me come back later when it's more convenient. And I find that people appreciate that attitude and usually say, well, sure. And I'll ask, when's a good time to come back? Well, I'll just say, most any time. Then I'll suggest a time, like Thursday night at 7 o'clock or, or Saturday morning at 10 o'clock. And when they agree, then I go back at the appointed time and they're ready to hear me. And usually they listen. And in most cases, they do trust Christ as Savior. So be careful about going in. The next thing I want to say is uh, be a good listener. If you expect someone to listen to you, you must listen to them. When you go into the home, you could ask questions like, how long have you been living here? What kind of work do you do? Now, wait a minute. If they're hesitant to answer the questions, don't hold them. There may be some reason they want to share that information with you. Just move on to another question. And ask, uh, are you natives of Atlanta? Are you natives of this particular town? If they mention some town they moved from and you know someone there, you could, you could talk about something you have in common about that particular town they used to live in. Do some talking. Maybe there'll be a deer head on the wall. You could ask, uh, did you shoot that deer? And usually if the man did, he'll tell you when he did it and he'll get into a long conversation about it. Be a good listener. Let them do some talking. And then number 13, only one do the talking. What I mean by that is if two people are out soul winning together, one should never interrupt the other. Neither should one try to correct the other while they're witnessing to someone about Christ. It's all right for both to talk for a little while. You can talk about mutual interest or about uh, job or about uh, how long you've been in the community. But when one person asks the question, if you die today, do you know you go to heaven? And the indiv individual responds, no, I'm not sure. And that person then begins to present the plan of salvation. The other individual should not interrupt them. They should pray. 
for the person witnessing and to the person being witnessed to. Number 14, stay on the subject. It is difficult to stay on the subject when you're witnessing to someone because they have a tendency to ask you questions about uh, are you premillennial? Are you Baptist? Are you Methodist? And so you stop and back up and start answering questions. I have learned it's uh, very wise to say something like this. That's a good question. It shows you're interested in the Bible. And as soon as I finish what I'm showing you, I'll come back and answer that question for you. Then I go right ahead with the plan of salvation. If they interrupt me again and say, well, what about so-and-so? Again, I will say, that's a good question. And it shows you're interested in the Bible. And as soon as I finish what I'm showing you, we'll come back and talk about that. But if you stop in the middle of the presentation to answer three or four questions about the Bible, the person will forget what you were saying to them. You need to stay on the subject and not be interrupted. So stay on the subject. I suggest, uh, number 15, that you stay in the same book in the Bible. Let me explain what I mean. I can take verses from many parts of the Bible and show a man that he's a sinner. For instance, I can turn to Ecclesiastes 7.20 and, and read the verse where it says, There's not a just man on the earth and doeth good and sinneth not. But if I open the Bible to Ecclesiastes 7.20, then I go back from Ecclesiastes to Romans, then I've got to thumb through the Bible and, and, and take time to try to find the page. And what happens is you get nervous and you can't find the page and you're not effective. You need not go from one book to the other. You can stay in the same book in the Bible. In a minute, I'll show you how to stay in the book of Romans and present the plan of salvation. Number 16, draw a map in your Bible. I suggest that uh, in a few minutes when I present the plan of salvation that you start with Romans 3.10. And next to Romans 3.10, write the next verse you're going to use, which will be Romans 3.23. The next Romans 3.23, write the next verse you're going to use, which is Romans 5.12. Then next to Romans 5.12, write the next verse you're going to use, which is Romans 6.23. Then next to that verse, write the next verse, which is Romans 5.8. And then if you would memorize, say, John 3.16. And next to Romans 5.8, just write John 3.16. Now you can use Romans 10.13. But I like to use John 3.16 or John 3.36 because I can better explain believing on the Lord Jesus than I can explain calling upon the Lord Jesus, which is the same thing, but I can explain it better by using the word believe, which is a word that's used nearly a hundred times in the Gospel of John alone. Number 17, get them lost in your own mind. Now, I don't mean by this that you, that you just conclude that a person's lost even if they tell you they have trusted Christ. I remember one dear lady who used to go soul winning from our church, and she was an unsaved church member. As a result, when she would talk to someone about Christ and they'd say they'd been saved, uh, she invariably would just insist they were not saved. She would say, I'm just like you were. Said, I used to be a member of a church, but I wasn't saved. I was an unsaved church member for years, and she thought everybody was an unsaved church member. Now, if a person tells you they're saved and they're trusting Christ as Savior, Accept that. It's not our business to go inside the person and, and try to determine whether or not they were sincere in their decision. It's our business to preach the gospel to every creature, to show them how to be saved, and give them an opportunity to trust Christ as Savior by simply saying, wouldn't you really like to trust Christ as your Savior? Now, number 18, when you start to witness, this is the question you ask. If you die today, do you know you'll go to heaven? I usually say something like this. Now, I've enjoyed visiting with you, and, and I appreciate you allowing me to come into your home. I know a man only has so much time with his family, and, and uh, so I can in honor you let me visit with you a few minutes. Before I leave, let me ask you a question that only you can answer. If you die today, do you know you'll go to heaven? Now, there's probably three or four possible answers. Number one, yes, I know it. Number two is, I think so, or I hope so. Number three is, uh, no one can really know that. Or maybe they'll just plainly say, no, I do not know that. Okay, suppose they say, yes, I know it. In that case, 
You may say, well, how do you know it? Tell me what you did that makes you know you're going to heaven. If they give you a good, clear Bible answer, something to the extent that they are sinners and Jesus died for their sins and they're trusting Christ as Savior, then you know they're saved. If they give you some answer like I'm, I'm doing the best I know how or I've joined a church, then you know from their response that they're trusting something other than Christ for salvation. They're trusting their good works or they're trusting their church membership. Or maybe they'll say, I've been baptized. In that case, they're trusting their baptism rather than trusting Christ. Now, you don't want to offend anyone, but you simply show them that going to church and being a good person does not necessarily mean that one is saved. That you have to make a decision to trust Jesus Christ as Savior. Now, second possible answer is, uh, I'm not sure. If someone says, well, I'm not sure, then you can say, well, let me take the Bible and show you how you can know for sure that when you die, you're going to heaven. Or if someone says, well, I think so, or I hope so. I'll usually say something like this. Now, the very fact that you said, I hope so, indicates that you have some doubt, doesn't it? The person will say yes. Then I'll say, may I take the Bible and show you how you can know for sure. Many times I've gone through the plan of salvation, shown a person how to know they're going to heaven. And when I finish the plan of salvation, the person will say, well, I've already done that. I've already trusted Christ. In that case, I'm not aggravated. I don't feel I've wasted my time because though the person had trusted Christ as Savior, they lacked assurance. And what I did was help lead them to assurance of salvation. Once they say, well, I've already done that, then I turn to John 3, 36 and show the person that the man who's trusting Christ as Savior has everlasting life. God said it. That's God's promise. And the basis of our assurance is the written word. That's what the scripture says in 1 John 5, 13. These things write we unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that ye may know you have everlasting life. So I'll lead into assurance. I've had many people who weren't sure of salvation. They said, I hope so. I think so. After going through the plan of salvation, they trusted Christ as Savior. Uh, I mean, they assured me they had trusted Christ as Savior. And then I showed them in the Bible that if they had trusted Christ, they were saved. That's the promise of God. And they were led to assurance, and I was able to get them back into church and active for Christ again. At that point, have your Bible ready. If it's in your coat pocket, reach for it and open it and point to it and begin to give the plan of salvation. Don't wait for him to say, yes, you may take the Bible and show me how to be saved. Now, with your Bible open, the first thing you want to do is show the man that he's a sinner. So if you're making notes, write number 19, show him he's a sinner. We do this by using Romans chapter 3, verse 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Then we use Romans 3, 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, now in just a little bit, I'm going to have someone join me here, and I'll give a demonstration showing you exactly what I've been doing since 1961 that resulted in people being saved every week of my life. But let me go ahead and finish this first. Show him he's a sinner. Number two, or number 20, I think it would be, show him why he's a sinner. Romans 5, 12. Wherefore is by one man sin and into the world, and so on. Next, 21, show him the wages of sin. Romans 6, 23. Now, don't worry about getting your notes. I'm going to come back, and we'll take a little more time with this in the demonstration, so you'll have time to get all the Scripture references. Number 22, show him that Jesus Christ paid for his sins. You do this with Romans 5, 8. You show him the wages of sin with Romans 6, 23. Uh, number 23, review the plan. I mean by that, just simply go over it again. Number one, you know you're a sinner. Number two, you know that sinners owe sin debt. Number three, you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay your sin debt. And number four, you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior and explain what faith or trust means. Then ask if you may pray. Then you bow your head and in the prayer, you pray for what you want. This is not a prayer meeting. This is not time to pray around the world. You pray now for exactly what you want. You simply say, Dear Lord, the best I know how I've shown so-and-so how to be saved. If I could save them, I would. And you will not save them against their will. So I pray that in a moment when I ask them to trust you as Savior, that they will do it. 
then stop in the middle of your prayer with your head still bowed. You'll see that in a few minutes in the demonstration. With your head still bowed, just simply say, wouldn't you like to trust Jesus as your Savior? Use a man's first name or last name, whichever you feel comfortable with. Say, John, wouldn't you really like to trust Christ as your Savior? When he says yes, then ask him. If you mean that, shake hands with me. And when he puts his hand over on yours, then lead him in a simple prayer, expressing his faith in Christ. Now, prayer does not save you. You're saved by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. One can trust Christ uh, in his automobile or at home or at his office. But the prayer is a verbal expression of your faith. You're simply saying, Lord, I know that you died for me, and I do trust you as my Savior. Once he prays, then you can close the prayer, thanking God for his salvation, praying that he'll make his profession of faith public, praying that he'll go ahead and follow the Lord in believers' baptism. You can pray he'll get into a good church and serve the Lord and win his friends to Christ. Pray for what you want for the individual. Thank God that he's trusted Christ as his Savior. When you close the prayer, the next thing you want to do is lead him to assurance of salvation. You may do this by turning to John chapter 3, verse 36. You simply open the Bible and say, Now let me show you a verse in John chapter 3 and read it to him. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Then ask him, What does this scripture say? He that believes on the Son has what? And let him say it, everlasting life. Did you tell me you were believing on Christ, that you were trusting Christ? Yes, I did tell you. Did you pray and tell the Lord you'd trust him? Yes, I did. And he says in this verse, he that believes on the Son has what? And he responds, everlasting life. What you're doing is leading him to assurance of salvation based on the written word. I was saved when I was 11 years old, but I never had real assurance of salvation. Now, you may doubt that I was saved because I lacked assurance, but I, I really had periods of doubt because I did not know how to determine whether or not I was sure. I didn't know the basis of assurance. I, 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 I based my assurance on my feelings. The result was when my feelings subsided, I lost my assurance. I based my feelings on, uh, on what I thought. And as my thoughts changed, my assurance changed. But I learned later in life that the assurance of salvation or the basis of assurance is the written word of God. I know I'm saved because the Bible says so. Now listen, I feel good, but I don't know I'm saved because I feel good. I know I'm saved because the Bible says so, and I feel good because I know I'm saved. You lead him to Christ, then you lead him to the assurance of salvation. What I'd like to do now is uh, demonstrate what I've been sharing with you. In other words, I'll take the practical advice I've given you in this lecture and now put it into practice. I have with me Dr. John Reynolds, our associate editor here at the Soul of the Lord Foundation. And uh, I'll talk with John as if I'd never met him. I'll open the Bible and show John how to be saved. The thing I'll be doing is what I've been putting into practice since 1961. It's not something I've read in a book. It's something I know works because I've seen it produce converts down the aisle every week for as long as I was pastor of the church in Atlanta, Georgia, until I resigned there in 1977. Now, what I want you to do is watch very carefully and make notes. You may observe something that I did not share with you in the lecture earlier. And when I finish, I'll come back and call attention to those things that I did that I think will be helpful. But uh, I want to talk with John now and I won't interrupt what I'm doing with John by commenting back to you. I'll finish, and I'll come back and comment with you later. Uh, John, I'm Dr. Hudson. How are you doing? Fine, Dr. Hudson. It's good to meet you. Good to meet you. I've enjoyed visiting with you, John, in your home. And before I leave, I'd like to ask you a question that only you can answer. If you were to die right now, John, do you know you go to heaven? Well, I certainly hope so. Well... John, the very fact that you said, I hope so, indicates you have some doubt about it, doesn't it? Well, I, I have some doubt, I guess. I don't know that a person could know that for sure, can they? Could I take the Bible and show you how you can know for sure that when you die, you're going to heaven? 
Well, I'd be glad to look. All right. Now, I'm opening to the book of Romans, John, not because it's my favorite book in the Bible, but because it deals with what we want to talk about here. And I want to show you a verse in Romans chapter 3. It's verse 10. Here the scripture says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. You see that, John? Yes, sir. Now, John, if that verse is true, it means though I'm a preacher, I'm not righteous, doesn't it? Well, yeah, that's what it says. Yeah. And, John, it would mean you're not righteous too, wouldn't it? Yes, sir. Okay. Let me show you another verse. It's Romans 3, 23, same chapter. Here the scripture says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Do you see that? I see that. Now, watch the language. For all have sinned. Now, John, if that verse is true, it means, again, though I'm a preacher, I've sinned because the Scripture said all have sinned, doesn't it? That's what it says. And, John, it would also mean you've sinned, wouldn't it? Yes, sir. Now, John, that little expression, come short, means to miss the mark. It's like I were to hang a target on the wall, and everybody in your family and I would join in and try to throw a dart and hit the bullseye on the target. Let's say that you miss the bullseye on a quarter of an inch. And uh, other members of your family miss the bullseye an inch or two inches and so on. And I threw a dart and I missed the bullseye a foot. Someone standing back could look and say, there's no difference. And I said, no, wait a minute, there is a difference. John came closer than all of us. The person could say, no, no difference, because all came short of the bullseye. Mm -hmm. That's what God means here in Romans 3.23, when he said, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. John, if a man goes to heaven, God has a perfect standard that he must live up to. But then God turns around and says, but no man came up to the standard. All came short. Some missed it that far, some that far, and some that far, but nobody's been perfect. Let me give you an illustration. When I went to high school, you had to make 70, you had to average 70 to pass. If you averaged anything less than 70, you had to repeat the grade, you failed. Suppose you averaged 65 and I averaged 35. Well, though you averaged 30 points more than I did in your, in your grade average, the truth of the matter is both of us failed because neither of us reached 70. When God looks down, he, he doesn't say there's a good person and there's a bad person and there's even a worse person. God looks down and says there's no difference. Why? Because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, let me show you something else. This is Romans chapter 5. It's verse 12. And here the Bible tells us why we're sinners. Years ago, if you had asked me, why is a man a sinner? I'd probably say because he sins. But that's not really true. The sins do not make the sinner. The sinner makes the sins. Let me show you what I mean. Romans 5.12 says, Wherefore, as by one man sin, watch it, singular, entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death is passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Now, by one man, the scripture has reference to the first man, Adam. When God created Adam, he created him in a state of innocence. He gave him one prohibition. You can eat of all the trees of the garden, but one tree you're not to eat of it. For on the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. That's Genesis 2, 17. Adam disobeyed. He became a sinner. As a result, when Adam's children were born, they were born sinners. They inherited the sin nature from their parents. And then their grandchildren inherited it from their children. All the way down to when my father was born, he inherited the sin nature. And when I was born, I inherited the same sin nature. John... S-I-N, sin is what we are. And sins, S-I-N-S, sins are the things we do because we are what we are. Now, we got this S-I-N nature from our parents, and they got it from their parents all the way back to Adam. And because of that, we all have committed sins because the Scripture says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, because we are sinners, John, we owe a penalty. Here the Scripture says in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. You see that? Yes, sir. Now, John, suppose I say, and by the way, I should explain that. The word death means more than dying with a gunshot wound or a cancer or even a heart attack. The word death there has reference to the second death, the lake of fire. Revelation 20, 14 says, death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Now, I'm a sinner. I owe the penalty, which is death, the second death, the lake of fire. When I die, unless I trust Christ as Savior, when I die, I go into the lake of fire to stay forever and ever paying the penalty for sin. Suppose I said to you, John, I don't want to go to hell. I think I'll join the church. Well, the verse doesn't say the wage of sin is join the church, does it? Mm, no, sir, that's not what it says. Suppose I said I think I'll start living good, and, and that's wonderful. Everybody will live the best they can. 
But the verse does not say the wage of sin is living good, does it? No, sir. Suppose I said, John, I'll, I think I'll join the church and be baptized. Again, the verse does not say the wage of sin is join the church and be baptized, does it? No, sir. Uh -uh. The truth of the matter is the wage of sin is death, the second death, the lake of fire. And all I can do to pay it is die and go into hell and stay there forever and ever and never get out. But John is a bright side to the story. It's back in Romans chapter 5 and it's verse 8. Now watch it very carefully. Here the scripture says, but God commended his love to waters. That is, he showed his love to waters. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now watch it carefully. God showed his love toward us, you, me, and the whole world. How did he do it? While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now watch it. We're the sinner. We owe the sin debt. The penalty, which is death, the second death, the lake of fire. But while we're sinners, owing the debt, Christ stepped in and died for us. It's almost like I'm a prisoner on death row awaiting my date of execution. Like, say, January the 1st. Nothing else has to happen. As soon as January the 1st comes, they execute me. But in the meantime, someone loves me so much he steps in and pays the price for my crime. God loved us so much that he said, while we were sinners, owing the debt, that he allowed Jesus to step in and pay the debt for us. Now, John, that raises some questions. Number one, if Christ died to pay what I owe as a sinner, then he couldn't have been a sinner. If he had had sins of his own, he would have had to pay his own sin debt. Remember the verse I read a while ago by one man's sin and into the world? Mm -hmm. When Jesus was born, he wasn't born like we were. He was born of a virgin without an earthly father. Being born of a virgin without an earthly father, he didn't inherit the sin nature that we get from Adam because he is not a son of Adam in that sense. Does that make sense to you? That makes sense. I understand that. And, and on top of that, John, he lived 33 years in the earth and never one time committed a sin. The Bible says in Hebrews 4, 15 and 16, he was tempted in all points as we are and yet without sin. And when Pilate turned him over to the angry mob, he said, I find no fault in him. Jesus never sinned. He was the sinless son of God. Even the thieves on the cross, one on either side, one said to the other, this man has done nothing amiss, referring to Christ. The word amiss means wrong. This man has done nothing wrong. Even the thieves saw in Jesus the sinless Son of God. Now, John, since Jesus had no sin of his own, God took our sins and placed them on Jesus. And that's not just preacher talk. That's what the Bible says. Isaiah 53, 6 says, The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all, just like I lay this Bible over on this hand. God laid every sin I've ever committed on Jesus. The little sins, the big sins, the sins I forgot about, the sins I hope nobody ever finds out about, all my sins were laid on Christ. 1 Peter 2.24 says, He his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. And John, while Jesus was bearing our sins in his body on the tree, like I hold that Bible in my hand, God punished him in our place to pay the debt we owe. That's what the scripture means when it says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Somebody said the Jews killed him. I said, you're wrong. Somebody said the Roman soldiers killed him. I said, you're wrong. God did it. God loved us so much that he let his son die in our place to pay the debt we owe so that when we die, we don't have to pay that debt. Now that sounds like everybody's automatically saved, doesn't it? It sounds that way. Because he died for everybody. Right. But the transaction is not complete until we accept it. I often say that everybody's potentially saved, but not actually saved until they trust Christ as Savior. It's like me writing out a check and giving it to you for $10,000. The piece of paper actually is worth about a quarter of a cent, but potentially worth $10,000 depending on what you do with it. If you don't believe me and don't go to the bank acting on, on your faith, you don't ever get the $10,000. You can just tear the check up and throw it away. Everybody's potentially saved in a sense because Christ died for everybody. But nobody's really saved until they trust Christ as Savior. Now let me explain what it means to believe on Christ. Uh, to believe Christ means to trust Christ, to depend on Christ. Many folks have always believed in Christ. What they mean is they're giving mental assent to a fact. But to believe on Christ means to trust Him, to rely on Him, to depend on Him. Let me illustrate what I mean by using this chair. Okay. Suppose I came into the house and you said, uh, Doc Hudson, have a seat. And I keep standing. And you say, well, don't you believe that's a chair? And I say, oh yeah, I believe that's a chair. 
You say, well, don't you believe it'll support you? If you were to sit on it, I'd say, yes, I believe that. But I keep standing. I could answer all the questions correctly. Yes, I believe it is a chair. I believe it will support me. And then die and never enjoy the chair, chair holding me up. I must make a decision that I will depend on the chair, that I will trust the chair. Now, I'm going to trust the chair the way you have to trust Christ. I believe it's a chair. I believe it will hold me up. So I'm going to sit on it with all my weight. And when I sit down on this chair and take both feet off the floor, I'm fully depending on this chair to hold me up. I have no confidence in anything else. If the chair falls, what happens to me? Well, you fall. Yes. <laughs> now, suppose I hold on to this table with 10% of my weight and put the other 90% on the chair. The 10% destroys the 90% because the 10% says I'm not fully trusting the chair. John, there's no promise in the Bible to those who partially believe on Christ. The promise is to those who believe on Christ. When you come to Christ, you must trust Him completely. It cannot be Christ plus my church or Christ plus my good life or Christ plus my baptism or anything else. It must be Christ and Him alone. You must trust Christ completely. Now, John, let me ask you four questions. Number one, would you admit that you are a sinner? Oh, yes, sir. I'd admit that. Do you really believe, like the Bible says, that sinners owe penalty? Yes, sir. I believe that. And that that penalty is death? Right. And number three, do you really believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay for your sins? Yes, I, I believe that. And you, you really believe that he died in your place? Yes, sir. I do. Okay. Now, number four, John, Christ is listening to what you're going to say to me. And only you can answer this. Wouldn't you really like to trust him as your Savior? Yes, sir, I would. If you mean I that, would. shake hands with me, if you mean it. Okay. Do it? Now, John, with your hand in mind, I'm going to lead you in a simple prayer. And you need not pray it unless you really mean it. But if you mean this, I want you to tell the Lord you'll trust him in your own words, all right? Dear Lord Jesus. Dear Lord Jesus. I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I'm a sinner. I do believe. I do believe that you died for me. That you died for me. Here and now. Here and now. I do trust you. I do trust you. As my Savior. As my Savior. I'm completely depending on you. I'm completely depending on you. To take me to heaven. To take me to heaven. When I die. When I die. Now, John, let me close the prayer. Father, I thank you that John has prayed. And in your own wonderful way, let him know that he has everlasting life. I pray you'll never be ashamed of this decision. I pray he'll go to church, make it a public decision, and then follow the Lord and believers' baptism. I pray he'll live for you and use his influence to win others to Christ. Bless his life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, John, let me show you another verse. It's over in John chapter 3. It's a wonderful little verse that I want you to remember. And maybe make a note of this verse so you'll always have it. It's John 3:36. Here the scripture says, He that believeth on the Son hath, what's the next two words? Everlasting life. Now who said that, John? Well, that's the Bible. And the Bible is whose word? Well, it's God's word. Now, and God said, He that believeth on the Son has what? Everlasting life. Now watch the rest of the verse. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Now, John, there are two groups of people in that verse. The first group is believing on the Son. And the second group is not believing on the Son. Those who are believing on the Son have what? Everlasting life. And those who are not believing on the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on them. Right? Right. Now, you told me a minute ago you would trust Christ as your Savior, didn't you? Yes, sir. And I explained to you what it meant to trust Christ by illustrating uh, faith by sitting on the chair, right? Yes, sir. And you prayed and told Christ you'd trust him. Yes, sir. Now, trusting means believing. Right. And he says here, if you believe on the Son, you have everlasting life. Now, if that verse is true, do you have everlasting life? Well, I sure hope so. Well, now, wait a minute. I want to help you. I don't want to leave you with a hope. I want you to know. What you're saying is, I hope God told the truth in that verse. No, I believe God told the truth. Okay. Then did you tell me the truth when you told me you would trust Christ? Yes, sir. I told you the truth. Yeah. I, I did And do God that. told the truth. Yes, sir. Okay. It said, if you believe on him, you have what? Everlasting life. Who said that? Well, God said that. Did he tell the truth about it? Yeah, he told the truth about now, it. Now, if he told the truth, what do you have? Well, everlasting life. But I don't know whether I'm that good or not. Yes, but it didn't say he that believes on the Son and lives good has everlasting life. 
It says, he that believes on the Son has everlasting life. You're adding something to the verse. Now, you ought to live good, but you don't get better to get saved. You get saved to get better. Now, back to the verse. He that believes on the Son has what? Everlasting life. And you told me you would believe on him. Yes, sir. And you meant it. Yes, sir. And he said you had what? I see that. Yeah. Everlasting life. Now, you know you have it because he said so. Because he said so. Suppose Jesus were to walk into this house and look you straight in the face and say, John, I know that you're a sinner. You need not talk about it. I know all about your life. But, John, I died on the cross for you. Your sins were laid on me, and I suffered your hell on the cross. John, would you trust me to take you to heaven? What would you tell Jesus? Oh, I'd tell him, yes, sir. And he'd shake your hand and say, John, you have everlasting life, and you'll never perish. And he left and walked out the door, and he never came back. If any friend were to see you after that and say, if you die, will you go to heaven, what would you tell them? Oh, I'd tell them, yes, sir. If they said, why do you know you're going to what would you tell them? I'd tell them, Jesus told me so. Yeah, that's the point I'm trying to make, John, Okay. That you know you're saved because Jesus said so. Now, if I write you a letter and sign my name to the letter, are the words in the letter my words? Oh, yes. All right. As much so as if I talk to you on the phone? As much so, yeah. yeah. Or as much so if I visit with you like I'm doing now and talk with you face to face? Are the words in my letter just as much my words as these words I'm speaking now? Sure. Really, the words in the letter will stand up stronger in court than what you hear me say because what you hear me say is hearsay. Mm -hmm. But if you have it in writing, it's stronger than hearsay. Yes. And Jesus gave you something better than standing here and telling you you have everlasting life. He gave you his written word for it. Mm-hmm. You got it in black and white. Okay. So if you ever doubt it, you can turn back to John 3, 36 and read, He that believeth on the Son hath what? Everlasting life. Yeah. Now, John, I'm going to tell you something. And I'm as serious. I don't know how to be about this. If you don't go to heaven, I will not go to heaven. You're probably wondering why. And the answer to that is because I'm doing the same thing to go to heaven you're doing to go to heaven. I'm trusting Christ. It's like you and I got in a boat and started across the lake and the boat started sinking. And you said, I hope I make it. And I said, I hope I make it. And you said, well, I know you'll make it. You're a preacher. You live good. I said, now, wait a minute, John. I'm not trusting my preaching or my good life to get me across the lake. I'm trusting this boat. If the boat sinks with you, it sinks with me. We're both in the same boat. In other words, you're trusting the same thing to get us across the okay. lake. Mm -hmm. Now, the point I'm making, John, is I'm doing the same thing to go to heaven you're doing. I'm trusting Christ. And you're trusting Christ. If you don't go to heaven, I won't go to heaven. Mm -hmm. Do you see that? I see that. Now, let me ask I you a question. That. Based on what this Bible says, if you die right now, where will you go? I go to heaven. Who said so? God said so. That said so. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Now, if you need a man to Christ, the next thing is that he needs the assurance of salvation. Many people who trust Christ as Savior never join a local church and receive believers' baptism because they lack assurance. You notice with John, it took me a little while to lead him to assurance. I kept explaining that the basis of assurance was a written word. He said, I don't think I live good enough. Well, you just go back to the Bible every time and put his feet on the Bible. The basis of assurance is the written Word of God. Now, notice several things I did while I was witnessing to John. I used his name all through the conversation. I got his name. By the way, you should get the name of the individual, and if you feel comfortable using the first name, go ahead. The last name, then use the last name. But I felt comfortable using the name John, so I talked with him all through the conversation. I kept him in the conversation. I did it by asking him questions. Now, I'll illustrate. Notice something. In Romans chapter 3, verse 10, John, it says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Do you see that? Yes, sir. You see, I asked John a question. He answered yes. I kept him in the conversation. Now, watch. Now, John, if that verse is true, it means, though I'm a preacher, that I'm not righteous too, doesn't it? Yes, sir, it means that, I guess. And, John, it also means you're not righteous. Yes, sir. Now, you notice, I asked three questions. Do you see that? That means I'm a sinner. John, it also means you're a sinner. See, I kept him in the conversation. You notice something else. I, I made the, I asked this question first. Now, John, if that's true, it means I'm, I'm a sinner, doesn't it? And he said, yes. I wouldn't say, now, John, if that's true, it means you're a sinner, because he'd probably think, I guess you think you're not a sinner. So I made myself the sinner first, and I made John the sinner second. So I kept him in the conversation by asking questions. Now, notice something else. I mean, I maintained eye contact with John. Every time I wanted him to look at me, he looked at me. Now watch what I'm doing, and you'll, you'll see this. Notice, John, in Romans chapter 3, verse 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Do you see that? Yes, sir. 
Now, John, that means if that's true, I'm not righteous. Yes, sir. Now, do you notice what I did? When I wanted John to look at me, I simply closed my Bible. Now, watch it again. You see this verse, John? Yes, sir. Now, that means that there's none righteous. No, not one, right? Yes, sir. You see, every time I close my Bible, bring it back to myself, John looks back at me. He doesn't keep looking at the floor. You have to say, look at me. All you got to do is when you point to the verse, then close your Bible, and he looks at you. And you want to show another verse, you go back, and then you close the Bible, he looks at you every time. So what you're doing is you're maintaining eye contact. If you're not communicating with a guy, you're not going to win him to Christ. You've got to use his name. You've got to maintain eye contact. Now, another thing I did is that, is at the close of this particular presentation, I didn't pray like I gave you instructions to do. I went ahead and led, in, led into the question. Now, you don't always have to do the exact same thing. Remember, I'm just giving you some general information and advice and some suggestions on how to win people to Christ. You'll also notice that during the presentation, I used some verses that I did not give you when I gave you the point by or step by step instruction on how to lead a soul to Christ. For instance, when I came to Romans 6, 23, I quoted Revelation 20, 14. So I suggest you write next to Romans 6, 23, Revelation 20, 14, and that you memorize it. It's a very simple verse. It simply says, death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is a second death. I was using that verse to explain to John what the second death was. Then uh, I didn't open my Bible when I quoted John 3, 16. If you know the verse, you need to open your Bible. The point I was making was after I showed John he was a sinner, and he understood it, and I showed him that he owed the sin debt, and he understood it. Then I showed him that Jesus died to pay the sin debt. The point I made then was that, John, to be saved, you must trust Christ as Savior. Then I illustrated that by standing and pointing to the chair, because many people do not understand faith. Faith means total dependence on Christ. I believe there are thousands of people who would trust Christ as Savior if they simply understood it. We must make the message clear. Men are saved by grace through faith, by trusting Christ as Savior. Now, there's another hour lecture I sometimes give on how to get the convert down the aisle for baptism. That is, once you went into Christ, then you invite him to church, and you stay with him until you get him baptized. Then you teach him from the Bible how to live for Christ and how to win others to Christ. You see, the Great Commission is not complete until you follow through. The Scripture says you go and you teach and you baptize. So you should follow through on your convert and try to get him into your local church. Get him a part of the fellowship so he can listen and learn and grow as a Christian. That's very important. Now, I will not go ahead with the remainder of the lecture because of the time. But we have a little booklet, simple little booklet. It sells for $1. It just simply is entitled Winning Souls and Getting Them Down the Aisle. If you're interested, you may write to the Soul Lord Foundation, and we'll be glad to send you that little booklet which is a remainder of this lecture. Before I close, let me ask a question. Have you trusted Christ as your Savior? You've heard the presentation of the gospel. Do you know you're a sinner? That Christ died for you? Have you trusted him? Now, I'm not asking, have you joined the church? Or have you been baptized? Have you understood the gospel clear enough to where you could really put your faith in Christ and trust him as your Savior? If you haven't, let me urge you to trust him right now. In your words, just simply say, Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. I believe you died for me, and I will trust you as my Savior. Now, if you have trusted Christ as your Savior, do you know someone that should hear this message? Do you know someone that should be saved? What about your mother, your father? What about a friend? What about a neighbor who lives in your neighborhood, maybe next door? Maybe someone you work with. If you know someone without Christ, would you take the information that you've been given on this simple little lecture on soul winning and go put it into practice? In 1961, I heard a lecture similar to what you've just heard. I went out on Saturday and put into practice what I had learned, and the first three people I witnessed who trusted Christ as Savior, you can win souls to Christ. There are many anxious souls waiting for somebody to tell them how to be saved. When I was in Atlanta, folks told me that Atlanta was gospel-hardened, but I discovered from first-hand experience that Atlanta, Georgia was more gospel-ignorant than it was gospel-hardened, and I think that's true of the world. Many people would like to be saved, but simply do not know what to do. The most wonderful thing in the world 
is leading people to Christ. There's nothing more precious to God than the salvation of a sinner. That's why Jesus died. Everything else in our ministry is a means to an end, but the bottom line is getting people saved. New buildings, buses, papers, books, magazines, all of that is a means to an end, but the bottom line is reaching people for Christ. If you will, do your best to lead someone to Christ. Why don't you make a commitment right now and tell Jesus in your own words, I'm going to try to win my mother to Christ. Then pray for your mother and ask the Lord to help you to be an effective witness. Say to the Lord, I'm going to try to win my neighbor Bill to Christ and ask God to make you an effective witness. I'm going to close with prayer and I'm going to ask you, if you've never trusted Christ, to pray and tell him you will trust him as your Savior. If you have trusted him, then I'm going to ask you to make a commitment to go and try to lead others to Christ. And if you will, name people that you intend to try to win to Christ and ask the Lord to help you to be effective. Now let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, the best I know how, I've shown men how to lead others to Christ. You're the Savior, and no one is saved unless they agree to trust you as their own personal Savior. If there's some viewing this videotape who never trusted you, I pray they'll trust you right now. And I pray that thousands of others will go out and try to lead neighbors and friends to Christ. And dear Lord, may there be multiplied thousands in heaven who would not have been in heaven had it not been for this simple videotape on how to lead souls to Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.